Hello everybody and welcome to Just Women Africa. My name is Ola Lika Amosa and the founder of Just Women Africa. And today we're doing our second into Zoom interview all the way from New York, Brooklyn. And today we have CC Closet in the house, the founders of CC Closet. Um, yeah, welcome to the show, ladies. The show, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. So excited to be here. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. All right. But before we start the show, please like, leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and tell your friend who knows a friend about Just Film in Africa. All right, ladies, we're about to start. All right. So before we get into Sissy Closet, can you ladies just tell us a briefly about yourself? Yeah. So my name is um, Uchala. Um, I'm one of the co founders of Sissy's Closet. Oh, I'm Shioma, one of the, the other co-founder of CC's Closet. Yeah. And um, we started this brand um, to help people incorporate um, Africa into their everyday lives. So people throughout the diaspora will have like products that both affirm their beauty um, and their sense of style and fashion um, in an African way. Okay, that's interesting. So can you tell our viewers, um, in what year did you actually start CC's Closet? So we started CC's Closet at the end of 2015, so right after I graduated from college. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. 2015, that to make it uh, six, seven years? Six years. Wow, that's, um, that's, that, all right, that's amazing. Okay. So can you tell us what compelled you guys, so you ladies, to um, actually open a business and call it CC Closet? So, um, and so in terms of the business, um, I'll let Chilma tell the story okay. of how she started it, and then we can talk about our name after. Sure, sure. So in terms of how we started, so in 2015, I hadn't been to Nigeria in over 10 years. And then right when I graduated, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather had passed. Um, and so we were going back to celebrate his life because he lived a long, full life. And at that point, I hadn't been back to Nigeria in such a long time. And when I came back, I was kind of... It, it was, I hadn't realized how much of the Western canon about Africa had really seeped into my own thinking. Um, so I was surprised and shocked by the level of craftsmanship and, craftsmanship and beauty that I found there. So when I went to the market on one of my trips out and about in Lagos, I found these gorgeous stunning bags that I absolutely loved. So I got one for myself. I got a souvenir for Chenny because she wasn't able to come. And, um, and I brought them back to uh, the US. And when I came back and I wore them to my graduation party, Everyone, all of my friends loved them. They were asking me where I got it from. They were like, oh my gosh, this is so cute. I've never seen anything like this. And I was super excited. And at that point, I had been looking for a business to start because I had a job in consulting, but I wanted to do something entrepreneur. I knew that's where I wanted to go. And so when I saw my friends were excited and interested in it, I was like, oh, like this could be something. And my sister is the most creative and exciting person that I know. So I was like, I have to talk to Chenny because we can probably design some really amazing bags and have them well made in Nigeria. And so um, that's kind of how the whole story started. Okay. Yeah, that... and in terms of our name, when we first started, um, Shoma did originally want to call the brand Shoma's Closet. And I was just like, girl, <laughs> if we're gonna be partners in this um can we at least like have me in the name somehow so chum's nickname for me is chenny um and so cc represents the two c's um that come to form cc's closet yeah okay perfect all right so i was saying this was back in 2015 Right. So how many bags did you bring in from Nigeria, Choma, when you went in 2015? So when I went for the first time, I brought back um, three bags. I got one for my mom, I got one for my sister, and one for myself. And then at the at my my graduation party, people were loving it. So I was actually got in touch with my aunt and my cousin, and I had them help me buy about, I think it was 20 or 25 bags um, in the markets in Lagos. And I wanted to see if people would like, or if they just talking, like they were just being nice and be like, this is cute, or if they actually wanted to purchase them. So we got that first set of bags, and then I was able to sell it to my friends and um, some people, most of my friends. And then once I had done that, I was talking to China about trying to make the business bigger. And Chani came and she was just like, we need to formalize all of this. We can't just be selling out of a suitcase and you just chatting people up to sell bags. 
So, Chenny, you want to tell them what you did? Chenny? Mm-hmm. Um, so, Chenny was really like, oh, we need to have a website. Yeah. So, um, I created a website, I created a brand, created a logo. Um, um, and then we sort of launched and we thought that people just magically found us through Google. Um, <laughs> And um, we spoke to a couple of influencers um, to post about us and that the rest is history. Yep. That's fantastic. Okay, guys, you're still watching Just For Women Africa. Do not forget to hit the subscribe button, leave a like, tell a friend who knows a friend about Just For Women Africa. And today we have Sissy Closet all the way in New York, Brooklyn, on the show with us. Okay, so you started off in 2015 and after that you created a website. Can you tell us what have been some of your challenges in running a business um, in America? I mean, having to bring good goods in from Nigeria, having to sell them in America. What has been some of your challenges? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. I would say when we first, first started, the first challenge we always had was inventory because we were creating stuff and trying to figure out what our audience was really interested in, we would always sell out of the really popular stuff really quickly. And then we'd have some stuff that would sit around longer. So figuring out how to get people excited behind that. And then because of the way the markets work in Lagos, um, sometimes like a print or a fabric that we really love will go out of stock and people will keep asking us for it because like the internet is forever and Pinterest will show people stuff from like five years ago. And then we'll get an email from someone being like, do you still have this in stock? Um, even though the pen says 2017. Um, So that was one of the most difficult parts. The second part was just really um, making, scaling up operations in Africa as well. So when we were scaling up operations in Nigeria, trying to find like um, someone to work with us on the ground on a day-to-day level, trying to find the right person for that took us a while. Um, And then also onboarding new tailors and artisans to work with us in terms of actually getting more of our goods made and getting them made in a faster time frame. Do you have any other challenges you wanted to talk about, Chen? You're there's some I think you covered pretty much everything. I think the other thing has just been like, you know, issues with like policy, um with yeah. the government. Like that's been like kind of tough. Um just like cultural differences between like how business is conducted and what people's expectations are for work um is another challenge. And then like just in general scaling. Um, but it's just it's it's tough to like sort of navigate a, a place where like, you know, there's just a lot less infrastructure to work with. For sure. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Okay. I wanted to know, um, so you bring in this stuff from Nigeria and you sell in America. How do you ensure quality of your product to sell um, in terms of the fabric? And, and uh, So when it comes to, yeah, of course. So when, um, before pre-pandemic, we would go to Nigeria pretty often, and that's where we would do trainings with um, our staff that was on the ground, um, and also make our tailors and artisans aware of what we considered high quality with products. So we kind of actually really formalized it and helped them get like a checklist of things to look for in terms of saying, deeming whether or not a product was like quality enough to present to us versus not. And then we have like a full-time, we have full-time managers there who are also in charge of the quality control. So our goal is to get as few products that don't meet our standards in the US as possible because once they're here, it's harder for us to repurpose them. Okay. So uh, it's all about setting the standard that you want and then making sure that people at, along the supply chain are aware of what that standard is. Okay. okay. That's that's, that's, that's fantastic. All right. All right. So, so, so for so our, so our viewers, viewers out there who are watching, can, can you just give give them a um, an insight in what type of products you sell online, online on, your on your website? Yeah. Sure. So we sell um, head wraps, um, African inspired clothing that's like super contemporary. Um, and super chic. Uh, we also sell beauty products, so um, like a washing net, um, as well as like shea butter lotions um, and scrubs as well. We, um, because people like to relax, we've also started to offer bath bombs and shower steamers too. 
Um, and then we also have like a, a very limited jewelry line. So we sell like some waist beads um, and like some gold plated earrings. Okay. Okay. All right, that's interesting. Okay, so um, I was read going through your profile, and um, I noticed that um, you used to do already made items. Then along the line, you moved to um, actually making your own products. What made you decide to start making your own products? Oh, that was Chenny. So when we first started, when I think you were talking about the bags that we had that we purchased them from the market, from the artisans who had the high quality that we wanted. Um, right. When Chenny came in and she was like, I was like, oh, like, I'd really love you to do the creative part of this. She really wanted to design her own bag. So yeah. that's when she started working hand in hand with artisans to design some really gorgeous bags that we started out with. And then from there, it's always been stuff that we, that we um, made, have ourselves. made ourselves. Okay, all right, that's great. So I would like to ask, um, as a woman, I mean, do you, so do you ladies do this full time? Yes. Okay. okay. So as a woman in, um, in America, what are some of the challenges you face, I mean, doing business there? I mean, is it, is it completely, are the challenges different from being, um, in, being in Nigeria or being in America? Can you repeat the question? You cut out for a bit. Okay. okay. Can, you Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Oh, I was that's... asking, what, as a woman in America, oh, sorry, as women in America, what are some of the challenges in, um, in running a business like yours? Is it different from the challenges in Nigeria or is practically the same challenges you face over there? I feel like it's kind of a difficult question because I feel like um, in Nigeria, that's like a, a part of the business that's completely separate from what we do in America. So um, in America, we're more marketing um, and operations like focused in a customer facing way because our customers are for the most part um, American um, and Canadian. Um, but when it comes to us dealing with people in um, Africa, Nigeria, um, and Ghana, it, it's like more of the manufacturing piece and component of it, right? So we're managing um, people making the product when we're in um, Nigeria versus managing selling the product to our customers in America. Um, I would just say, um, in terms of being a woman, I think our, our, our business is very women's focused. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, uh, we have had too many challenges there. Um, I mean, of course, maybe in some situations there might be a safety concern when we're overseas. Cause it's like, okay. They recognize like, okay, these girls are American. Um, and that could present some challenges, but that's very, very rare. Um, and, and I think one of the challenges that would be the same across is like, I think that sometimes depending on who you're working with, like we've had some, some issues with some people that we tried to work with where they weren't taking us seriously. Um, yeah. And I think part of that was in part because of our age, because we were in our early 20s when we started, and then in part because of our gender. And I think um, when you're working across, like, because both America and Nigeria are quite patriarchal societies, so um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just what it is. Uh, so there can be, so when working with some of our male, uh, some of the men who had worked with us early on, there are some people that we had to part ways with because they weren't showing us the respect that we deserved. Um, and so it's just about kind of establishing those boundaries, establishing how you want to be treated and making sure that you enforce that. And that can be difficult, especially because as women, we are generally um, raised to be more, um, to be nice, honestly, is what it is. <laughs> 
that you don't really want to always you don't want to always bring up and like kind of like reinforce your boundaries but in business like there's no there's no room for nice you just have to you need to do what you need to get done in order to make sure that the people who rely on you both your customers and the people who work for you are able to both um, prosper and so um for us, like, I think that's one of the things that I've grown a lot with and with business is just having to be more um, assertive in terms of like what I want and reinforcing that. Cause um, it can be, cause I'm, I'm like a, I'm, I'm a nice girl. Like I like to be nice. I like to be liked. Um, but sometimes you just can't, you can't be everyone's friend. <laughs> and some people just need to be told what it is. And if they, if they're not, if they're refusing to um, move in the way that you need in order for your business to operate effectively and efficiently, then um, you just gotta, you gotta move forward. Okay. That's good. That's interesting. All right. Um, 2020 was, was an interesting year. I mean, COVID came along and and um nobody really expected it i mean nobody really planned for it and it's gone on long and for it. some people did expect it <laughs> <laughs> i always think it was because luchana had been reading about it much earlier than when we were really fully formally informed about it so mm -hmm. i think we were actually in ghana at the time when china was reading the article to me yeah. about what was going on in china and she was just like hey like have you heard of this thing and I was just like, and I kind of was just like in like, oh my gosh, it's New Year's, I'm partying, like, I don't care. And I hadn't really paid attention to it. And then three months later, lockdown in New York. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So I wanted to know, what has been the impact on COVID on your business? I mean, people, uh, people would really like to know because businesses around the world are suffering and um, some are recovering, some have recovered but people really don't know the stories of how it's really affected businesses all around the world. So can you tell us how COVID has affected, affected your business from 2020 to now? Yeah, it's been really challenging. I think one of the things that's been tough for us is just um, finding and maintaining like personnel, um, particularly more so in America. It like, I, I miss, I'm not gonna lie. I miss the, my, my old team um and just how efficient and like systematic everything was before the pandemic the other thing is, is that like you said it's been tough for all businesses i feel like we sort of like shift to survival mode um and i felt like um i feel like a lot of times you have to continue to be like creative and innovative in how you approach your marketing so that you're consistently like growing a new audience so you can keep your business alive. Um, for us, that, mean, that meant like just expanding our product line um, to encompass like um, people who are working from home now. And um, so we'll, we'll create products that are like, that's easy to sit in in the comfort of your home um more protective styling for like zoom calls so we have like a whole thing about like you know if you want to work from home and you are uh you have a work call put on a head wrap um instead of a wig um and then also um i i think that this um this um, pandemic has also been a opportunity for us to even just like really sit down and um, utilize the tools that we have at our disposal. So, you know, um, there became a huge rise of the use of TikTok and we definitely started using that to grow and expand our business um, and our customer base. That's been like great for us because I think it's allowed um, people to see a more authentic side of us um, mm -hmm. that they haven't seen before. And we, we never really showed too much BTS footage before. We didn't do any BTS before. But, um, <laughs> now, now people get a sense of like who we are, what every day, what life is like every day in the office. Um, in addition to that, like more emails, um, more SMS messages, um, just so that people can get a feel for who we are, know that there's like real faces behind the brand, um, and have like a good understanding of what we sell and what we can do for them. Yeah, and I think one thing I would like to add is that, like, for us, it just really made us have to, one, we had to um, expand our production more. So prior to, um, prior to COVID, we hadn't really had as much coming out of Ghana as we did, uh, as we did 
during, I guess we're still in it, so to, as we do now. <laughs> and, um, and then we also had to expand and have some production happen in the US as well, just to, especially for those months where nothing was, nothing was shipping really in this world. It was really crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to really expand our, um, kind of expand our mandate as a business because we wanted to make sure that we continue to serve our customers and one thing that was really important to us is that we didn't want to let go of any of our international staff because we knew that there were, it's not like they were going to be able to get a job somewhere else at that time. So we had basically everyone was um, in Nigeria, people weren't really working because they couldn't, because you couldn't go out. But we need, wanted to make sure that especially our full-time staff were able to continue to pay them through the pandemic. That was extremely important to us. So we were able to do that and we were able to sustain that through expanding our production here in the U.S. so that we would be able to continue to um, run our business. Okay, that's interesting. I wanted to ask Uchino a, a question um, just to confirm. You said that you missed your old staff. Are you referring to staff in America or your staff referring to staff down here in Ghana, Nigeria? Uh, so, like, in, 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 um, in America, like, um, I do in America. So, in Nigeria, we've maintained the same staff um, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and we're probably we actually expanded. Yeah, you know, we found we found more people partners to work in um, in in Nigeria, but um, in America, it, and it's not so much like oh because of the pandemic we fought we fired them, but it's like you know sometimes they like graduate, they move on to like other projects, like other companies, other things that they might be interested in. Um, but like rebuilding um, and getting back to like the systems that we used to have, it just seems like it's just taking us so much longer. Okay, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. COVID has really affected everybody, I mean, globally. Okay, all right, guys, you're still watching Just for Women Africa. Do not forget to subscribe button, button, leave a like, leave a comment, and tell a friend who knows a friend about Just for Women Africa. And today, I'm not sure, we have a Zoom meeting all the way from New York, Brooklyn, and we will be... And we're with CC Closet, um, the founders of CC Closet, Choma and Uchema. All right. Okay, guys. Um, all right. So you guys basically sell in the U.S. Do you sell at any other way else apart from the U.S.? So because of Shopify, our store is able to ship worldwide. So we have a lot of European um, and U.K. customers as well. Canada is a big um, one for us, too. Uh, uh, we recently had some people in Korea purchase from us, which is pretty cool, um, in Iceland, oh, yeah. which, is, which was exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, and then some, like, we've had a couple of people from South America too, so, and Mexico. So it's, um, so we're really, I guess we're worldwide now. <laughs> yeah, we're international. <laughs> international. Okay. Oh, and South Africa. And South Africa. Yeah. All right. Um, we're about to round up um, on on the interview. Uh, Dustin, talk to the question. All right. Some and um, this this has nothing to do with CC closet or anything. This is just a general question for women out there in um, in Africa, in the diaspora, in America, in Europe, African women out there. Men, women say feel is a man's world. Women f say men take a, take advantage of them sexually in order for them to uh, get to the next level. Um, women say they're not just enough. Um, sits on the table on the board of directors of companies for them. Um, women just feel that it's difficult climbing up that ladder because they feel that men just put stop blocks in front of them. What advice can you give out to women out there um, who feel that it's a man's role and it's just difficult to climb up the ladder? I mean, you ladies have been able to make it, other ladies have been able to climb up the ladder. What advice can you give out to them out there? I think that's a really good question. I think when it comes to, um, so one thing, so one, trying to let me know about the statistic that most of the women who make six figures plus um, in the U.S. are entrepreneurs, right? 80%. So 80% of the women who make, um, who make that top earning salary are entrepreneurs. So a lot of the times we are forced to, not always because we want to, are forced to create spaces for ourselves where we can feel safe and comfortable. Um, and so if that's something that you have the willingness to do, if that's something that you have the energy for, um, if that's something that you feel that you can sustain yourself through, definitely go for it because not, because you have an 80% better chance of making $100,000 or more in salary. Um, I think in terms of like the way that the world is structured now, 
I think that there are more systems in place to protect women, but unfortunately you can't catch everything, especially because at the end of the day, systems are made up of people and there are going to be bad actors. Like that's just what happens. Um, and and that's an unfortunate reality for us to live in. So the only thing that you can do is really stay focused on what you're bringing to the table. So making sure that you're coming correct, making sure that you're putting your best foot forward. And if you come to a place where you feel that you can no longer grow in the space that you're in, then you, you can move on from that space. I think sometimes you have, we, we have an issue of like pivoting. And sometimes I think it's kind of an old way of thinking, I think less so with millennials and Gen Z, like people are more comfortable leaving a job for a better situation, right? And so like we have like the, what is it called in America? The great um, resignation. The great resignation. Like a lot of people are leaving jobs that are not giving them the comfort or mm -hmm. the type of lifestyle that they want or the type of environment that they want. That's in the US. I think um, internationally it can be a little bit more difficult depending on the gender politics of where you are. Um, but in that space, I would suggest, I would just suggest trying to find the best possible place for you to work where you feel that you can thrive and grow and, and kind of come to your full fruition as a person and as an employee, if that's what you want to be or as an entrepreneur. Okay. Yeah, I think my advice to women would, to, would be to not lead their life in fear. Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunate that we do live in a patriarchal society, but I feel like you should constantly be challenging yourself and asking yourself, what would you do if you were unafraid? Like, if it wasn't unusual for a woman to speak a certain way, to be assertive, um, to have demands, um, to have high expectations of herself and the people around here, you would just say how you felt. You would just um, speak those, um, those, you would just share those expectations loudly and unabashedly. And I feel like I, I am a woman. I love, love, love to see other like strong women. And when I say strong women, I mean that not so much as in taking everyone's like crap and baggage, but <laughs> being someone who's like not afraid to express her full self um, because so much of society is like, oh, like it's so interesting that you can like just share how you feel or you're not afraid of like upsetting other people. Well, why should I be afraid of upsetting other people if they're the ones who are making me upset? They didn't care about my feelings then. And I think that like, you know, in spaces where you can demand that equality, demand that respect so that people know that you're not playing around, that you're not um, someone to be fooled around with um, and that you, you mean business, especially when you're starting your entrepreneurship, don't start it off as some like expensive hobby. Take it seriously from the very beginning so that people don't have a choice but to take it serious. Okay, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Okay, on to the act. So what is the future for um, CC Clotters? Yeah, the future. What does the future hold? Um, so we're super excited because right now um, we have a brand partnership with the second largest um, retail in the U.S., Target. We're really excited about congratulations, that. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our customer base has been extremely supportive. Um they, they sold out of every single store that they're in. Um, <laughs> they're aggressively trying to put more products um, online and in other, um, in other stores. So we're really, really grateful about the success of that partnership. And what you'll see um, in the future is more successful brand partnerships with CC's Closet. Okay, thank you, Chama. Um, okay, guys, just... Uchana, sorry, Uchana. All right. <laughs> Okay, guys, you're still watching Just for Women Africa. Do not forget to hit the like, sub subscribe button, tell a friend who knows a friend about Just for Women Africa. And today on the show, we'll be having a Zoom interview all the way from New York, Brooklyn, with Sissy Closets. And we'll be the founders of Sissy Closets, uh, Choma and Uchina. All right. Okay, ladies. <laughs> okay, ladies, we're just about to round up. All right. For, for our viewers out there, um, Probably it's the first time they're hearing of Sissy Closet and they probably want to make a purchase or you know make an order. Can you give a how do they make that order? Can you give out your contact details? Sure. So we're online. So if you go to CC's Closet NYC.com, you can find us. And you can also find us on social media. So across platforms, we're CC's Closet NYC, we're CC's Closet NY on Twitter. 
Um, but yeah, you can find us all across the internet um, at Cece's Closet and they'll have links to our website. Okay. Oh, and you can shop our Target collection on Target.com. Okay, that's great. That's fantastic. Thank you, ladies. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I really appreciate you doing the interview. I wish you the very best and um, success with you. Success with your new um, agreement which you signed with Target. Wishing you all the best. Thank you. All right. Okay, okay ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.